Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Terence, um, colleague of uh, Jack at uh, the university. Um, I'm given the responsibility to introduce the first speaker of the conference. Uh, but before I do that, um, uh, let me just add that um, I believe um, uh, today we have a very diverse uh, audience, both from Hong Kong and from around the world. Um, in the past two weeks, I had uh, conducted uh, three pre-conference events trying to promote the conference and um, to various local groups. Obviously, you could imagine the idea of platform co-op is very new to many people here in Hong Kong. And um, um, not only students and academics attended those workshops, but also um, people like um, startup entrepreneurs and also some uh, social movement people. So um, today, of course, we have many co-op practitioners coming from all over Asia and all over the world. So I would like to echo uh, Jack's point that um, the platform co-op movement is about concrete uh, practices. But yet, uh, as I think Jack and I, Jack will agree with me that um, we, as we are both academics, we also feel that uh, it is very important to have a very strong theoretical foundation to support the movement development. So this needs to, um, the first speaker of the conference, who I'm going to introduce now. Um, this, the first speaker of the morning session is uh, Michelle Bowens, uh, who is the founder and director of the Foundation for Peer-to-Peer -peer Alternatives, or better known as the P2P Foundation. Um, I believe it is correct to say it, um, um, Michelle is also from Asia, because he's now uh, based in Chiang Mai, Thailand. So actually, at the very beginning of the program planning, we said that we, we need to get Michelle come over to this uh, first PPC conference in Asia. And um, um, the work of the P2P Foundation is to envision a social and economic transition uh, based on the commons paradigm and the P2P dynamics. Um, as I'm also a researcher of the commons, I've been quietly following um, Michelle's work for quite a long time. Um, so while I would describe Michelle as a P2P theorist, He's also a very down-to-earth practitioner and participated in many research projects and social experiments um, on P2P commons transition, not only on individual projects or organization, but um, even for an, 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 an entire city in Europe and even a whole country in South America. So uh, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Michel to take the stage and um, deliver his talk title, uh, Technology for the People, How and Why, Michel. Um, can you hear me like this? Yeah. Okay, then I, I'm safely protected from the crowd and I don't need the mic. Um, so my presentation will be in uh, real 3D, so no PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and I, I must say, I'm, you know, of course, the, thank you for inviting me and all the organizational work has been done. Um, if you're there tomorrow, I have some colleagues uh, from SMART, which is a labor mutual to which I belong as well. Um, and I'm a member of two other co-ops. Uh, I'm a lifelong, lifelong member of the Madison, Wisconsin Food Co-op and of Newby, which is a new cooperative bank in Belgium. Um, so the theme today is about you know, technology, uh, technology for the people, how and why. And so I would like to start maybe with um, kind of arguing against a mainstream opinion, which is that technology is neutral, right? This is what we hear from many people. Technology is neutral, it depends what you do with it. So you have an atomic bomb, you can show it to, some, to kill some people, you can, uh, or you can make them die slowly with nuclear uh, plants. Uh, it depends what you do with it. Um, and I, I would argue against that uh, vision and say that uh, technology is a socio-technical system that is from the very beginning embedded in values and human interests. So in order to make that a bit more understandable, I will use a quadrant. So I don't have a, a presentation, so a quadrant, right? You have a X and Y axis. So imagine you have a vertical axis with uh, on the top centralized uh, systems and on the bottom distributed and localized systems. 
and imagine that the horizontal axis is on the left, maybe should be on the right, but on the left uh, for profit uh, motivations and on the right for benefit motivations. So that gives you four quadrants. And just to kind of give you an idea how this would work, so let's take the internet for example, right? So as far as I remember from reading the books that I read about 10 years ago about the history of the internet, it started very strangely with DARPA, a military research agency, and it was the non-commissioned officers, the surgeons and the corporals that were saying, hey, if there is a nuclear war, we can't talk to our officers, it needs to be peer-to-peer. -peer. It needs to be a distributed system so that if any node falls out, we can still communicate amongst each other. So very strangely, uh, we thank the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of the internet uh, to not especially horizontal organizations. But once they've, they did that, it was the scientists who took over. The scientists said, oh wow, we can use this to share our scientific findings, right? So we have already two layers. We have a layer of military research, and we have a layer of scientists that tweak and transform the technology to their own needs. Then uh, October 93, uh, I was there, uh, we have uh, the, uh, the first browser, uh, which changes the game because right from then on, it's for citizens. You have first thousands and then tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people uh, which say, wow, we can speak to each other, we can conduct collective intelligence, we can create encyclopedias together. Uh, but it didn't stop there, because once you have people, then business started to be interested. And so we have the Facebooks and the Googles and the Web 2.0, and they said, well, we don't really like that peer-to-peer -peer thing so much because we can't control it, so let's make it into a walled garden like Facebook. Let's reintroduce client-server, uh, client more hierarchical uh, technology. So we can see how a technology that was originally horizontal in the first three phases gets hierarchized because of the values and interests of, of business. And then, of course, after government says, oh, what are, the, what are all these people doing there? We need to control and surveil, right? So just one technology, you can see how different groups of people uh, tweak it and transform it uh, to their own needs. Um, to take an extreme example, which I really like because, because I visited them uh, some years ago, is the, you know, the Amish. You probably, most of them might know the Amish. It's a conservative, uh, evangelical, uh, Protestant group in the uh, United States mostly, where they live according to 17th century technology. So if you go to Pennsylvania, Amish country in Pennsylvania, you still see horses and buggies. Um, and so what they do is when they have a new technology is they filter it through their own values. So they ask themselves, first of all, is it in the Bible? This is one of their criteria. And they try to see what, you know, what their religious books are saying about it. But the second thing they do is, does it undermine our community? So the Amish have technological sovereignty. You know, we may like or not like how they do this, but they actually show us that it's possible for a community to say, we'll take this technology, we don't take that one, and we'll transform it so that it serves our needs as a particular community. So I, I would like to uh, introduce that notion of, you know, you know food sovereignty, right, probably. Uh, so also technological sovereignty is a very important thing. So no, value is, technology is not neutral, it's something that we can uh, tweak and transform. So today I would argue there are four socio-technological -techn systems that are vying for dominance uh, in our world. So four different technologies in these quadrants that are representative of human value systems and human interest systems, okay? So the first one, you probably, hi Trevor, um, you know, it wasn't complete without you, so good to see you here. Um, so the first uh, quadrant, the top left in this case, uh, is centralized systems which enable peer-to-peer -peer interaction. So that's a kind of a really, and with a for-profit uh, aim, right? So think about the Googles and the Facebooks on the one hand, and the Uber and the Airbnbs on the other. So if you look at the front end of these technologies, 
it, they are peer-to-peer, -peer, right? Two billion people, if I'm not mistaken, are today enabled and empowered to communicate permissionless, permissionlessly with each other using Facebook, for example. Uh, probably a higher amount of people uh, through Google search and other search engines can find each other's documentation. But of course we know that's only the front end, right? The back end is entirely centralized, proprietary, private. We look at Uber and BNB. So in the first case, we have people communicating with each other. In the second case, we have people exchanging peer-to-peer. -peer. Same thing. You have an extra apartment. You want to make a bit of extra money. You can say, let's use Airbnb, put my, apart my extra apartment on there, and, and, and any number of people can actually use it. But it's the same principle, right? The front end, peer-to-peer -peer exchange. The back end, centralized, proprietary, and in both cases, for-profit oriented. And as you probably realize, the uh, feedback mechanisms in terms of value exchange are not very fair. So this is a model which I think is very important because it's also new capitalism. And I would argue that we are moving, and you know, I hope you can follow what I'm trying to say here, we are moving from a Marxist capitalism where surplus value is extracted from natural resources and the surplus value of labor to a Proudhonian capitalism where surplus value is extracted directly from human cooperation, right? So this is a 19th century European debate between the anarchists and the Marxists. And Proudhon would say surplus value is created not by making people work harder necessarily and then you know, selling the, the value at a higher price, but it's because if you put 100 craft workers together, they'll be more productive because they're cooperating together. And so that surplus is today what the new capitalism is about, right? So Uber doesn't build cars. Airbnb doesn't build apartments. Facebook doesn't communicate. Google doesn't produce the, com the, the, do the documents. They're not hiring people, making them work for them, and then making money on the basis of their employees. They're making money directly through our commoning and peer-to-peer -to -peer exchanges. So this is very important because the it's a crisis of value. So more and more people are contributing permissionlessly, co-creating value, but we are not getting paid. If you look at Uber, I think, uh, and maybe Trevor will correct me later on because he's more aware of this than I, but the st studies I have seen is that on average an Uber driver works nine months. The time it takes to discover, it's actually not a good deal. Um, they are under the minimum wage and they are not able to build any social protection for their future life. So again, in Europe, the fastest growing group of workers is precarious, in the so-called independent workers, and they're the fastest impoverishing social group in Western countries. Only 20% of them will make it, meaning that they will have good pensions at the end of a, you know, their, their working lives. For 80%, this is a, like a, a straight path to poverty now in the future. Um, so this is basically what platform cooperativism is about, right? We, we see that capitalism is creating these platforms. I call them net article platforms, the hierarchy of the network. And so when we think about platform co-ops, we're thinking about tweaking and transforming a model which makes sense, right? So platform co platforms make sense because they are about sourcing idle resources. As we go into overshoot, ecological overshoot, as we need to bring down um, our human footprint on nature, it makes a lot of sense to do platforms and to, instead of making new things, let's say building new taxis or buying new taxis, using spare places in empty cars. It makes a lot of sense in itself. But then we see that Uber, because it's for-profit driven, Will, f will force a competitive behavior amongst its drivers, and so they will in fact drive more than before. So instead of actually solving the ecological problem, they are increasing it. Uh, I, I was in Madison for four months and I, uh, I was uh, actually taken by the taxi co-ops, of course they don't like Uber, 
And but I was, you know, taken on a tour, and and I was I saw this. All these drivers, Uber drivers, were were driving around in order to to get you know to get a ride. Um, okay, so that's the third tweaking and transforming that we can do. There's a second uh, form of capitalism that is emerging today, and which I would call distributed capitalism. Um, this is. Um, basically around Bitcoin, the blockchain, and all of that stuff. So the model here is, um, again, human values and interests. Yeah? Uh, so the model here is Austrian economics and anarcho-capitalist philosophy. And in this vision of the world, there is no community and there is no uh, trust. And actually, I've been to a few uh, blockchain conferences where actually this is how they start the conference, saying, you know, we all know we can't trust human, human beings, uh, which is a bit the case in the Hyatt uh, as well, uh, as I experienced this morning, having breakfast. Uh, but basically, um, uh, so this is a specific vision of humanity where we all atomize individuals. We all have to make a living, so we're all entrepreneurs. And since we cannot trust each other, we need to make contracts with each other, smart contracts. And since we can't trust people, we will verify these contracts through technology, right? So we trust the technology, and this allows us to scale our peer-to-peer -peer market exchanges. So this is the vision behind blockchain. I personally don't like that vision. Uh, it's not mine, uh, but I also, you know, after a long period of critiquing what the blockchain represented, and especially the extractive nature of these commodity-based cryptocurrencies, I had an encounter in Chiang Mai. You have to know Chiang Mai, where I live six months of the year, is, according to me, the global capital of digital nomads. There may be, it's competing with other places like Medellin and Ubud uh, in Bali, um, but it's one of the places. So we have a Facebook group called Chiang Mai Digital Nomads that has 25,000 members on it. They have three or four meetings a year, and we have four crypto meetings a week. So I don't know if Hong Kong has that, seriously, right? Uh, so it's a place where these types of things are happening, and because life is pretty good in Chiang Mai, so we have a lot of people from the whole world who are developers, web marketeers, so all the people who work on the computers don't need to be in a particular place. They come to live there because it's cheaper, the weather is nice, the mangoes grow on the trees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I had a kind of an epiphany when I went to one of these meetings, and so this, uh, this uh, person said, you know, the problem in Chiang Mai is that we can't hire anybody who's willing to work for money. And that was, a, that was a strange thing to say. Well, the reason is, of course, that there are hundreds, if not thousands of people already living from the token economy in Chiang Mai, and also from the bounty economy. And, you know, I was a Marxist a long time ago when I was young, so immediately my class analysis module went into overdrive, and I said, wow, that is interesting, right? Uh, so these are people who, are, who did something good for the workers, because we may like it or not, and of course it's a labor aristocracy, but developers are workers, right? So I'm explaining this because I think that these whole developments can also be tweaked and transformed, uh, just as we do with platform capitalism and making into platform cooperativism. I think we can... Uh, change blockchain anarcho-capitalism into post-blockchain distributed ledger commonism. So working for the commons, working for the commoners. So, so let me say a few things about how I was thinking about this. Well, first of all, before you would go to a bank, you would go to venture capital, you would beg for money. I, I, do, I, did, I had two startups, I know how that works. And if they decide to support you, they ask for equity. So one of the hundred companies would make it, but the workers would just get a wage, right? This is the old situation. Today you crowdfund it, you make a white paper, you crowdfund it, 
and you get money to, you sell the tokens and you get money from a bit everywhere. First interesting thing here is that it is already an ecosystem, right? This is no longer a capitalism based on big companies that dominate a vertical sector. This is an ecosystem which is not equal by any means, but it is more distributed and ecosystemic than we had before. It's designed to avoid domination by any single party. Uh, it has, it's more decentralized, uh, but that I think is an interesting thing because we need to move to more ecosystemic uh, ways of doing the economy. Second thing is that because of the tokens, the workers in this case get a lot more surplus value than they would have before, usually 40%. And it's not just for the people who start the company, it's for all the people who work now and in the future to develop these uh, ecosystems. Um, so, uh, so after this kind of epiphany, I said, wow, this is really int more interesting than I thought it would. Um, so I, I, I'm kind of presenting to you a research paper that I'm writing right now in the, in the summer. Um, should be finished, it isn't finished yet, but I, I want to present you a kind of a dream I have. Because what I discovered is that a lot of these blockchain projects are actually also done by progressive people, the Economic Space Agency, the Holo Chain. Um, so there's various groups working on, on the solar coin, the fish coin, are, are working on really interesting uh, developments. So imagine the following. You have a commons of code and design. So just as you have in open source, Linux, Arduino, Wikispeed, Wikihouse, the code is common. Around that common of code and design, various entrepreneurs decide to make a living and create a livelihood around this common uh, good. Yeah? And here I would make a difference between extractive entrepreneurs and actually the very word entrepreneurs, if you know French or Latin, it means taking in between. And so I imagine entrepreneurial coalitions. So you are a commoner, you have a life project, you build common resources, and you want to make a living through this passionate engagement with your particular commons. And so you are seeking to create a livelihood which is not extractive to that commons, but generative to that commons, right? Let's take agriculture. If you're an organic farmer, you improve the soil every year that you're working you're a generative farmer. If you're an industrial farmer, you impoverish the soil every year that you work. So this is the difference between extractive activity and generative activity. So imagine we have an entrepreneurial coalitions, sorry for the translators, for the new words. You have, I don't know how to translate that in Chinese. So you have entrepreneurial coalitions. Imagine, because we need a circular economy that those entrepreneurial coalitions would work together on open and shared supply chains. So in other words, today we can do this because every company works secretly, has a separate supply chain, and it takes ages to get anything done around the circular economy because we can't see what is happening. Imagine we'd have open and shared supply chains. Imagine these open and shared supply chains are linked to distributed ledgers but not the blockchain, but post-blockchain ledgers. And let me briefly explain why this is important. So if you think blockchain, you think we can't trust anybody. So every transaction has to be verified with all the other transactions in that blockchain. It's, you know, by definition, an exponential way to grow uh, these uh, verifications. Instead, we do it like nature. So this is what the holochain does. The holochain says, we can all create mini ledgers amongst each other. We trust each other. I trust Trevor. I have no problem creating a ledger with Trevor. And then uh, me and Trevor, we trust uh, Lisa and Frisia, who are sitting there, my colleagues from Smart, and they have their own little ledger. And then we connect our ledgers to each other, right? So it's a whole different way of thinking about ledgers. Now, a little, uh, a little historical uh, idea here. Accounting is very important, yeah? So the first writing that we found is a ledger. So writing comes from counting. So it's the temples in Sumeria 
which were counting the rice coming in and out of the temple. So this is the formation of the state, a counting state. Capitalism is linked to double entry book accounting. A Franciscan friar in, in Venice in the 15th century you know, synthesized uh, accounting for capitalism because double entry book accounting is here are my assets and here is how I grow my assets. It's a vision of the world from an individual corporate point of view which doesn't look at any externalities. It's not ecosystemic. So now we're working on three different accounting systems that they all exist. One is open and contributive accounting. So if you have a peer production community, you want to reward fairly all the contributions. Therefore, you don't use market-based accounting because the market is a value dictatorship. It says working in a bank is value creation but caring for your elders and children has no value. Running an oil tanker against a rock is good for GDP, is value, but voluntarily cleaning up the beaches has no value. You cannot work like this. I mean, if you want to do something fair and socially just, you cannot use purely market value because it doesn't recognize all contributions. So there are hundreds of groups in the world, I counted 400 uh, and a bit some years ago, that are developing very sophisticated open and contributive accounting system, right? So imagine open and shared supply chain, transactions verified with a ledger, and you have open and contributive accounting. Number two, REA accounting, resources, events, actions. This is a post double entry, so there's no double entry. It's an ecosystemic accounting for flows. With REA accounting, we no longer have to look at the world as are my assets growing, but we can see the flows in an ecosystem, in a cooperative ecosystem. Number three, biocapacity accountability. So I work with a group called Reporting 3.0. They call themselves multi-capitalists. I would choose another name, but it's, I don't get hung up on words. So these multi-capitalists believe that you have to take into account at least six forms of capital and that you cannot reduce them one to the other. So this is not about financialization of nature. This is about taking into account resources, thermodynamic flows, matter energy flows, right? And then in, uh, knowledge flows and, or, and financial flows, etc., cetera, and, and having a view on all of them at the same time without reducing one to the other. Um, so what is that? And so, okay, so they work on, on something called Global Thresholds and Allocations Council. So we look at how much copper there is in the world, how much cobalt. We look at the biocircularity, so the fl if we use copper a second time, how much can we use in the second iteration, etc. And then we bring this down to the granular level. This is called context-based sustainability, so that any entity on these open and shared supply chains and distributed ledgers knows what to do. So if you're familiar with the donut from Kate Rayworth, the donut economy, so she created a, a, a synthetic vision with an outer layer, which is the planetary boundaries. So we have eight basic functions in, on the planet that we need to survive as a planet. Four of them are already in the red. Two of them are in danger, and only two are, are still normal. So this is like the outer edge that we cannot go beyond, right? We cannot uh, behave uh, and continue to destroy uh, the planet that we need to survive uh, with other beings. Inside, she put the social needs. So how do we produce the social needs without exceeding planetary boundaries? So I'd like you to, to imagine, I know this is a visionary exercise, it's a bit utopian, that we would have this open and shared supply chains that recognize contributions, that can see the flow of resources and financial exchange, but also can see context-based sustainability, how we can produce without exceeding uh, limits. The good news is all that technology is available today. So if you would read my report, it's coming out in October, you will see that we have all this. The only thing we need to do is puzzle it together. Um, and of course, there's a lot of political issues because here's the key issue. 
capitalism doesn't recognize generative activity. So if I give you an example, Terre des Liens, community land trust movement in France, buys up land so that it's outside the market, outside of speculation, so the value remains stable and low. This allows them to, to rent uh, to organic farmers, which is already 10% in Europe now. These organic farmers, this is a, a study, uh, the more organic farmers you have in your county or département or province, the less depollution cost you have. So this means that the state and the water agency are saving millions of euros in depollution costs, right? This is a typical example. So you have a social entity that produces generative results that you can prove, but there is no mechanism. So the state is making, is saving all these resources, but the people who do it, who are generatively active, do not get any rewards from this activity. Does that make sense? So as long as we don't solve this, we are stuck in a ecologically uh, overshoot type of uh, political economy. And so I, I will finish this uh, second quadrant and how we tweak and transform this kind of uh, um, blockchain or post-blockchain systems uh, by giving you one example how we can imagine this happening. So this is uh, one of the many, many progressive blockchain projects. It's called Regen Network, Regenerative Network. And they propose something called ecological state protocols. So the state of the ecology. So let's, let's, let's imagine you want to do uh, biodiversity. We need more biodiversity. Or we need decarbonization. Or even let's imagine a social state protocol. We need more gender equity in the workplace, right? So these types of things. Um, so what happens here is you agree on an ecological state protocol and you create a permissionless contribution system that any citizen, any cooperative, any cooperation can carry out these generative activities. These are then lodged and verified and tokenized, so you recognize the value of this generative activity. And then, of course, the most difficult part, and this is political, this is uh, not easy, is to convince institutions to share their, you know, what they benefit from this positive social and, external and ecological externality. Does that make sense? So just to stimulate the imagination, this would be a way, a systematic and structural way to fund generative activities on any scale. So I'm just saying we can, we can tweak and transform these technologies from an extractive, exploitative model into something that works for the ecology and social justice. So now I need to move because I'm, I don't know how much time I have left. Um, 15, that's perfect, perfect. Um, I, we have two quadrants left. Uh, and so the third one is local and distributed with a four benefit orientation. That's easy, it's already good, right? So let me give you some uh, experience I had in that field. So last year, I worked for the city of Ghent. It's a city of um, 300,000 people in the north of Belgium. I know for Chinese people, this uh, it's like a speck, um, a speck in uh, you know like a little neighborhood or even less than that. But you know, for Belgium, our biggest cities are one million. So 300,000 is pretty good. Um, and Ghent has a particular history. So it was, you know, with Bruges, that most of you probably know as a potential or past tourists, uh, Bruges was called the Venice of the North. So these were guild cities in the Middle Ages. So they were ruled by the workers, by the guilds, for three centuries. Uh, they were a Calvinistic republic in the 15th century, and they were the city where the labor movement was born in the uh, 19th century. So it's a city that's not any city. Uh, it's an interesting, particularly interesting city. And what we noticed uh, in Europe for a number of years is the extraordinary growth of urban commons. Uh, so if you're familiar with the notion of the commons, 
let me just briefly say what I'm talking about. So the Commons is a shared resource. It can be energy co-op, uh, community supported agriculture, it can be a, a non-profit car sharing. Um, it can be open source software, free software, it can be open design, right? It's, it's a shared resource. It's maintained by a community or a group of stakeholders according to their own rules and norms. So next to the state form and to the private market form, we have this commons form, yeah? And here's what happened on a massive scale in European cities, and I went to Latin America, it's pretty much the same there, uh, is a exponential growth of urban commons. So we had 50 in Ghent in 2006, and we have 500 in 2016. This is very interesting. First of all, ecologically. So if you take non-profit car sharing, and there's one in Ghent, very small one for Chinese uh, uh, um, you know, scale, but it's 130 cars for 1,300 people. It's calculated so that anybody at any time can have a car, yeah? So there's no loss of mobility. It's 75% cheaper than owning your car. And every shared car replaces nine to 13 private cars, yeah? So Ghent is actually the only city in Belgium which has brought down its car ownership and car driving in the city. So think about it. If we commonify habitat, mobility, food, we can drastically reduce the human footprint. Um, by pooling resources, and this is what the commons is about, by pooling resources, we can drastically reduce the human footprint. But it's also socially inclusive. If it's 75% cheaper, that means a lot more people can have access to this kind of mobility. So the Commons Transition Plan, which we wrote uh, for the city of Ghent after consulting with 80 of these projects and nine workshops, um, basically uh, gave a, a sense of institutional design for public commons cooperation. So again, we talked about public commons cooperation instead of public-private partnerships, and we talked about communication of public services, yeah? Uh, de, if you like, a de of public services in which this, the notion of the city there is a notion of a partner city which enables and empowers you, social and individual autonomy, yeah? Uh, so this is a very important thing. So I should add that all these three quadrants that we discussed so far, the netarchical quadrant, the distributed capitalism quadrant, and the local urban commons and rural commons quadrant, are all three of them are growing exponentially. Yeah. The, uh, the specificity of this third quadrant, so local for benefit, um, is how it deals with the global. Yeah. So um, you might be familiar with the transition town movement, which is people in various regions and cities, uh, mostly in Anglo-Saxon countries, which come together to discuss peak oil. So in other words, what do we do when oil is $400 and we can't afford it anymore? How do, so they, they look at their city and, and region, and you know, they look at where the food comes from, where the, where the energy comes from, and they st to start thinking about transitioning to this uh, new reality. But what's typical of these projects is that they are slock, small, local, open, and connected, yeah? So basically today you could argue that there's no more local. If you do permaculture in Ghent East and you do permaculture in Ghent West, you may not talk to each other, but you're both connected to these global streams, right? You're connected to the global permaculture design course. But what is typical here is that the global is used for the local. Does that make sense, right? So there is global, global cooperation in knowledge and design and software, but it's all designed to help the local. It doesn't have an independent global vision. And this is where I now move to the fourth gradient, which is uh, what I call cosmo-local. 
it's a bit different. So one of the things we do uh, in the P2P Foundation is we study cosmo-local production. Uh, and uh, so basically the rule is uh, the following. Everything that's light is global and shared, open design, free software. And everything that's heavy is relocalized and distributed. So it's about combining global open design communities with distributed manufacturing and production locally, yeah? Uh, this is happening pretty much, for example, in agriculture. So if you would look at Europe, for example, industrial agriculture is no longer economical. So if you're a farmer, industrial farmer, you have a negative income if you wouldn't get subsidies from the state. If you are an organic farmer, you're poor, you're not making a lot of money, but you're actually positive. You have, uh, it's economically viable. And if you look at uh, organic farming, it's very much commons-driven, community-supported agriculture, collective purchasing groups, food co-ops, etc. And it's local, right? The zero-mile food systems and all of that stuff. So we see already cosmo-local production, this vision of relocalizing is uh, already present, uh, for example, in the food uh, provisioning systems. Um, so why is this important? A few reasons. Uh, humanity spends three times as much on transporting than on producing. Not financially, although actually the GDP of transport is higher than the GDP of production. But if you look at actual thermodynamic flows, matter and energy, it's three to one, right? And so today we have two visions. Uh, we have the vision of Trump and Brexit and the Polish and Hungarian governments, which is about nation-state protectionism, right? So the, the working class in Europe has been stagnating or declining for the last 25 years. They lost any hope uh, in uh, any improvement of the situation, so they're voting now for the radical populist right parties, anti-democratic parties, but in some profound way, they are national socialists, like they were in the 30s. So it's about social security, but only for the good guys, you know, the us versus the them, right? Um, and of course, the other uh, vision is continuation of neoliberal globalization, which poses huge, huge problems in terms of the human footprint on the planet. So I'd suggest we have a third option, which is cosmo-local production. And I want to say a little bit about how this could work for cities and introduce a, uh, a new notion. So we have platform co-ops, create one. We have, I don't know how to call them, ledger co-ops, create two. Uh, we have urban commons, five minutes remaining, thank you, uh, create three. And we have protocol cooperatives in create four. So we do the same thing, we tweak and transform what's there to make it socially just and ecologically sustainable. So I want to give you an example. This is about really about platform co-ops as well. So in Amsterdam, we have Fair BNB, right? So you have Airbnb, the extractive model. You have Fair BNB, a generative model. So all these uh, projects are emerging everywhere. But here's the thing. I went to Italy some years ago, and I talked to the Solidarity Economy Network and within that, they had a food uh, provisioning project. Only in Italy, only in the solidarity, solidarity economy, we have, I think it was 13 separate ordering systems. Yeah, this doesn't fly. If you're competing with supermarkets, it doesn't make any sense to redevelop 13 times the same software, right? doesn't make any sense. So we need to build protocol cooperatives. What is a protocol cooperative? Well, let's say, and this is a true example, that's the only one I know so far. So Partago is a small car sharing cooperative in Ghent. They're making their software available so that in any place in the world, they can copy this model of electric car sharing in, in other places, right? I think cities are key for this. So I see cities not just as local, 
but actually as cosmoglobal, as cosmolocal. So I see leagues of cities combining with each other to create global open design depositories for the various provisioning systems that we need to commodify in the future. I just want to say, uh, maybe end up with some kind of historical vision on this, because this is very important. 12th century Japan, 15th century China, 5th century Europe. So any civilization, actually every civilization, you know, it's a peer polity, so various ruling classes compete with each other for dominance in an international system. Because they are competing, they will always overshoot their local resources. Always, because if not, we were still living in the Roman Empire. It's gone, because it collapsed, right? So every civilization so far has collapsed, because it's gone. Um, and it collapsed because of periodic overshoot crisis, ecosystem overshoot. What happens almost every time, and you can check this with a study called Handy, Human and Nature Dynamics, or a book called Ecological Revolutions and the Axial Religions, if you would see this historical material, you would see that every time that a civilization is in crisis, we, we are re our economies and, and civilizations. This is a necessity. This is not something we like to do. This is something we have to do when we face with uh, resource crisis. Um, so, um, so I hope kind of to convey that message that uh, learning about the commons and how the commons work is really vital for the survival of, of, of a world civilization today because today we're no longer in a single separate geographic civilization, we have a world civilization. Uh, and in other words, the ecological crisis, the climate change crisis, peak resources, all of these emerging crises call for a rethinking uh, of our, how our societies could work. And I hope I I've given you a, a bit of ideas of what people in the world are trying to do around this. So we have platform co-ops, that's here. Uh, we have uh, open and shared supply chains through ledgers, that's another. And then we have um, global open design depositories for every provisioning system driven by coalitions of cities, ethical finance, cooperatives, uh, that create the software basis so that we can change everywhere. So we localize and adapt. We create a local co-op, platform co-op, but we don't all develop the same software. We work together on a global scale. Thank you so much.